Speaking during an October 2009 video conference in Hong Kong, Supreme Master Ching Hai mentioned the many... Wait, who? Supreme Master Ching Hai mentioned... Supreme Master Ching Hai. Okay, got it. The many hazards of genetically modified organisms along with the need to avoid their use to ensure human welfare. Nowadays, many people try to do this so-called genetically modified food. So sometimes we eat the vegetarian food and we don't even know that there are animal substance in it, scientifically speaking. Meat is being linked to disease of all kinds, with cholesterol, obesity, heart disease, and strokes. So if we put meat or animal substance into vegetables, then we will also have similar effect, more or less. Yeah, more or less. Inject meat into a healthy vegetable and you make it unhealthy. But here on the Pothole of 54 channel, we tend not to simply believe what masters tell us, even if they are supreme. We like to check the facts and see what the scientific research shows, as published in respected peer-reviewed journals. So let's try to find a slightly less emotional argument against genetically modified food. What happens when you consume plants that have been altered, artificially concocted in a laboratory by profit-driven scientists working for the most evil corporation in the world. Okay, let's leave the evil scientists to one side and take a look at some real science. Contrary to the images, GMOs aren't made by injecting meat or poison or anything else into healthy plants. They're made by splicing part of the gene of one organism with another to pass on favourable traits. The reason they're in demand is that they endow plants with favourable traits like higher yield or pest resistance or salt or drought tolerance. In theory, genetic modification shouldn't be harmful at all. After all, we ingest bits of DNA all the time and have done for thousands of years. That's what our food is made of. There's no reason why modifying a few nucleotides should have any effect at all, let alone turn us into hideous monsters. In the case of one type of genetically modified tomato, for example, a gene that produces the enzyme polygalactoronase is deactivated. That stops the tomato softening, making it ripen closer to the time it's consumed. So will the lack of polygalactoronase cause health problems? Well, most researchers say, why should it? People who don't eat tomatoes at all seem to do just fine. There isn't even a hypothesis to test or a mechanism by which the lack of polygalateronase might affect us. Even so, exhaustive studies have been done to look for any adverse health effects, and so far none has been found. In fact, the hyperbole of the anti-GMO campaign is what really scuppers their claims. Because if GMOs really are the cause of cancer, brain damage, metabolic collapse, and... What else? Digestive disorders, organ damage, tumours, allergies... Yeah, right. Then that ought to show up among the billions of people and animals who've been consuming it over the last 20 to 30 years, compared to those who haven't. The studies that have been done have all drawn a blank. So let's try the opposite tack. Are there any studies that do show negative health effects from GMOs? Well, if there are, we ought to find them cited by the huge number of anti-GMO organisations that have sprung up in the last 30 years. But I have to warn you, the reason the opening of this video had a slightly mocking tone is that I've had to wade through a lot of nonsense to get to it. So here are a few warning signs. First, be wary of anyone who feels the need to dress up in order to impart scientific information especially when his lab coat looks like it's never been used. I'm part of a group of doctors. Second, be wary of someone who says he's part of a group of doctors, when in fact he's a chiropractor. That are out bringing the truth about genetically modified foods. Thirdly, never trust anyone who tells you he's speaking the truth. Science depends on evidence that's consistent with a hypothesis. Truth is a religious concept. And the harmful effects that it has on our health. And fourth, check the information. So in 1989, Dozens of Americans actually died and thousands were affected 
an impaired by genetically modified version of the food supplement L-tryptophan. But if we check this claim, we find that studies have concluded that the deaths were not caused by genetic modification. They were caused by contamination of the L-tryptophan. So while the chiropractor in the white coat is free to announce his belief that these illnesses were the result of GM, he ought to admit that this is just his belief and not the result of published scientific research. But if there is a study that shows GMOs are harmful, surely it would be among these 10 studies that prove GMOs are harmful to human health, which has been cut and pasted all over the internet. Six of them fail at the first hurdle, because they aren't even studying the effects of GMOs on health, they're studying the effects of herbicides and pesticides. And anyway, one of these studies was so flawed, it was withdrawn from the journal Food and Chemical Toxicology. The argument goes like this. GMOs are designed to be resistant to pesticides and herbicides, therefore allowing more of these chemicals to be used without endangering the health of the plants and the residues from these chemicals may be unhealthy. Now, all this may very well be correct, but this is not proof that GMOs themselves are dangerous or unhealthy, which is, after all, the claim being made. First of all, only some GMOs are designed to be resistant to pesticides and herbicides. Others decrease the need for pesticides because they're engineered to be pest-resistant. And most GMOs have nothing to do with pesticides and herbicides at all. They're grown for completely different reasons, like rice that helps the body produce vitamin A, tomatoes that don't get squashed and spoiled, or drought-resistant maize. Of the remaining so-called proofs, two are not published in respected peer-reviewed journals, by which I mean journals that are on the master journals list. I know a study by something called the Institute for Responsible Technology may sound like authoritative and meticulously researched science, but in fact it's an anti-GMO website. Giving your blog a fancy sciencey sounding name doesn't turn you into a respected peer-reviewed scientific journal. I'll look at the other study on pigs in a moment. Number 10 consists of several documents a review paper that includes research into the effect of herbicides, not GMOs, and a paper on research methodology. Once again, nothing that lives up to the title and constitutes any kind of evidence, let alone proof that GMOs are unsafe. Finally, the only paper from a respected scientific journal, and one that could possibly be related to GMOs, is number two on the list, a paper by Spisak et al., it detected tiny amounts of DNA fragments floating around in the bloodstream. The DNA is not related to genetic modification, and the amounts are so small they could be due to contamination. But let's go with the conclusions of the paper. The fragments were predominantly found in people with inflamed stomachs due to Kawasaki disease, so why is this study proof that GMOs can be harmful to human health? The paper doesn't make any such conclusion. After all, there are all sorts of bits of DNA floating around our bloodstream, from dead cells, bacteria, viruses, and even from other humans. So why would bits of DNA from plants be any more or less of a concern? Well, the anti-GMO website kind of tells us. This still doesn't mean that GMOs can enter into our cells, it says. And that's right. In fact, there's no evidence at all that any of these bits of DNA are getting into our cells, And that's a pretty hard thing to do, unless they're bacteria or viruses fit for the purpose, which they're not. It's telling that the authors of this list aren't even proposing a hypothesis to show how these bits of DNA might infect a cell, and how and why this infected cell would then be harmful, and why it wouldn't be overwhelmed and killed by white blood cells. But given the fact GMOs have been linked to cancer, no, GMOs have not been linked to cancer, The link alluded to is one of the papers that deals with the weed killer glyphosate, not GMOs. This study demonstrates another cause for concern. Another cause? Again, none of these studies cited on the list supposedly proving GMOs are harmful have shown any evidence for that, let alone any proof. And certainly they haven't shown any cause for concern about GMOs. Even the authors of the Spisak paper don't think their discovery is any cause for concern, neither does the scientific community, since the paper's only been cited five times. However, if we ignore the hyperbole and talk seriously about the science, 
then the Spisak paper should certainly be followed up with more research. So you see the problem. A list of 10 studies proving GMOs are harmful can't come up with a single study published in a respected scientific journal showing that GMOs are harmful. That didn't end my search by any means. I kept trawling through the anti-GMO sites, but kept coming up with the same references, especially this one, number 9 on the list, published in the Journal of Organic Systems. Once again, the title sounds impressive, but this is an online journal started in 2006, and it's not on the Master Journals list, which made me wonder why it got the attention of the Reuters news agency, who echoed the claims of the authors without question. Scientists say new study shows pig health hurt by GMO feed. Something tells me that Carrie Gillam, who wrote the Reuters story, didn't actually read the paper. For one thing, her story seems to have simply copied and pasted what's in the abstract. Those pigs that ate GM the GM diet had, had a higher rate, rate of severe, severe stomach, stomach inflammation, inflammation with a rate of 32% of GM-fed GM pigs, pigs compared to 12% of non-GM-fed non pigs. The severe stomach inflammation the was worse in GM-fed males compared to non-GM-fed non males, males by a factor of four, and GM-fed females compared to non-GM-fed females by a factor of 2.2. If Gillam had bothered to find out where those figures came from in the paper, she might have noticed something odd. It's true 23 pigs did have severe stomach inflammation compared to nine who didn't. That's not a very large sample size and that's where the 32% and 12% figures come from. What didn't make it into the abstract were the other stomach inflammation figures that could equally well suggest that GM foods are safer. After all, 60 pigs fed with non-GM food had mild or moderate stomach inflammation, compared to only 41 of the pigs fed with GM food. And the pigs fed with GM food were twice as likely to have no stomach inflammation altogether. Why? Who knows? The study contains no hypothesis to be tested, the sample sizes are way too small, and consequently the results don't show any consistent pattern. But for some reason none of this made it into the abstract, the peer reviewer didn't seem to notice or care, and Carrie Gillam at Reuters simply parroted what she read at the top of the paper. But in the end I did find a reference to a study from a respected peer-reviewed journal which might be relevant. Now here in Cell Research we have a new study called the Exogenous Plant MIR16A. And although many researchers are skeptical of the results, I can't find any responses indicating serious flaws in this paper by Zhang et al. The study found that microRNA found in rice can bind to receptors in mammalian livers and potentially inhibit production of a protein in mice that removes bad cholesterol. But before we get carried away... It can alter the expression, the function of your organs, such as the liver, and possibly, in fact, very likely, many other organs, including your brain, including fertility organs, including your kidneys, perhaps even your heart. No, I said before we get carried away. This was a study about microRNA found in ordinary rice, not genetically modified rice. So if anti-GMO activists are concerned about any effect this microRNA might have on humans, and there's no evidence it has any, perhaps they should run a campaign urging us not to eat rice. The Zhang paper is certainly interesting because it shows the potential for genes found in ordinary plants to work their way out of the gut and possibly find receptors in human organs, or at least in one particular case they might. I say potential and possibly because this is a very long way from discovering that this actually happens, and even further away from discovering that it has any adverse effects. And obviously a billion Chinese eat their stuff at least twice a day for their entire lives and don't seem to be affected. Even so, as with the other study, it's definitely worth doing further research. And that goes for GMO research in general. In my humble opinion, and treat this as the ramblings of a drooling idiot because I'm just a science journalist, however confident we are and however many studies have been done, the safety of our food supply is so important that we should be constantly monitoring the health of populations and updating studies. We may be 99.9% .9 sure, but there's no reason we shouldn't strive to be 99.99% .99 sure. 
and in return maybe the anti-GMO campaigners could stop the hype and the scary claptrap and stop lumping all GMOs together as collectively bad. The more genetically modified food you consume, the less human you become. Oh no, what's happening to me? Am I dying? There's a huge difference between GMOs like Roundup Ready that may promote the use of more herbicides, where it's the herbicides that could have health consequences, and GMOs that promote the production of vitamin A in populations that are vitamin A deficient, and GMOs that can be grown in areas that, at the moment, can't be cultivated. Let's have an honest and sensible debate, based on the evidence in the scientific literature, rather than a blanket attack on GMOs that misinforms and plays on people's fear and ignorance. There are things we should be concerned about, like dioxin, PCBs, hormones and other contaminants in food, and of course things like sea level rise, earthquakes, tsunami, climate change and viruses, because these are all concerns based on facts and conclusions published in respected scientific journals. What we shouldn't be so concerned about are links between vaccines and autism, an imminent ice age, or turning into pustulant zombies through eating GMOs, because these concerns are not based on facts and conclusions published in respected scientific journals. They're based on poster campaigns, blogs, and newspaper headlines. What I find fascinating is that the organizations embracing the scientific literature on the safety of GMOs, like the Heartland Organization and Fox News, are the same organizations who rail against the scientific literature when it comes to climate change and evolution. To show that GMOs are safe, Forbes magazine cites the endorsement of just about every major scientific institution. But when the same scientific institutions endorse the link between CO2 and global temperature, Forbes magazine is happy to ignore them. Conversely, the people urging us to accept the conclusions of researchers when it comes to climate change, like Greenpeace, are the same people who happily ignore the conclusions of researchers when it comes to the safety of GMOs. In other words, for extremists at both ends of the spectrum, the acceptance of science is subordinate to an ideological or political position. I find it much easier to go with the science, whether it fits my beliefs or not.